I have diabetes. I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. I have asthma. I'm at risk, too. If you're 19 or older with chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD, or heart disease, or are 65 or older, you are at increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. Ask your doctor or pharmacist about Prevnar 20, pneumococcal 20-valent conjugate vaccine, a Pfizer vaccine that can help protect you against pneumococcal pneumonia in just one dose. Even if you've already been vaccinated with other pneumonia vaccines, Prevnar 20 may help provide added protection. Prevnar 20 is approved for adults to help prevent infections from 20 strains of the bacteria that cause pneumococcal pneumonia. Continued approval may depend on a supportive study. Don't get Prevnar 20 if you've had a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or its ingredients. Adults with weakened immune systems may have a lower response to the vaccine. Side effects include pain and swelling at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle, and joint pain. For full prescribing information, please call 1-855-213-2138 or visit Prevnar20.com. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, it's Susan Coffin and you are listening to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Audio. Today we'll be talking about a tough topic and that's motivation, specifically academic motivation or how to keep your child's hope, optimism, and enthusiasm for learning up and running as the school year progresses, as the work gets tougher and tougher, and possibly setbacks in how school's going. And Dolan will be specifically addressing why school motivation tapers off and what you can do as a parent to motivate your student using various rewards, consequences, and how to increase your child's resiliency when things get tougher, when they want to give up. She'll also specifically address some study skills for high school and college students, which I think is very welcome since we often have parents of older kids. Let me just tell you about Anne. She is a wonderful specialist who we're so honored to have at Attitude. She has over 20 years of teaching, tutoring, consulting experience, and has worked with over, ready for this, 8,000 students. Her first book, which is called Homework Made Simple, won the Publishers Association Parenting Book of the Year Award in 2011. I really urge you to visit her website, Ann Dolan, A-N-N-D-O-L-I-N.com. Just tons of wonderful resources. So, Ann, thank you so much for joining us again today. We're, we're so grateful for your time. Well, um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. We also like to thank the sponsor of today's webinar. She is Dr. Jackie Paxton, and she's the author of a book called 31 Fun Ways to Increase Your Child's Attention Span. 31 Fun Ways to Increase Your Child's Attention Span offers suggestions for activities that your child will enjoy that will also gradually increase their attention span. It's an interesting idea. The book is available as an Amazon Kindle book, and it's coming shortly as a paperback. So 31 fun ways to increase your child's attention span. Thank you, Dr. Jackie Paxton. So with that, let me turn it over to Anne with our thanks. Well, thank you so much, Susan. It's great to talk to everybody today. Um, I, I love this topic, and I love it because there's so much parents can do to help kids when it um, comes to academic motivation. And we know that we're anxious by nature as parents, especially when our kids struggle in school. And we worry about a couple things. First, can our ch my child keep up in school as it is now? You know, can they keep up with the kid next to them, their peers? And as parents, we're also worried about the future because we know that high school and college are more competitive than ever. Um, we know that um, college enrollment rates have nearly doubled since we went to college 30 years ago and that it's expensive expensive to go to college. And we want to make sure that our kids are really prepared so that they can be successful in college later on. So as parents, there's often a trickle-down effect when we're stressed, and it is then imparted on our kids. So we often swoop in to help our kids. We'll sometimes pay for grades, and we'll even punish our kids if they're not keeping up in school. And before we know it, we become the parent we never wanted to be. The relationship with our child is defined by academics. So let's first start out by talking about why kids struggle with motivation in the first place, especially kids with ADHD. 
We know that there's actually a genetic foundation. In fact, a a new University of Ohio study found that about 40 to 50 percent of academic motivation is actually genetic. And it's an important reason why kids struggle to maintain motivation in school. So it's not a parenting issue, although parenting can certainly help. But sometimes our kids are just going to have a harder time than others. There is a mismatch between kids with ADHD and school, and it's really pronounced in transition years. For example, when kids are going from elementary to middle school, say from sixth to seventh grade, or even from middle school to high school, and that's because they're moving away from that coddled environment of elementary school, and now they have seven different teachers, seven different sets of expectations. They have to remember material for seven different classes. But in high school, they have all of those um, executive functioning areas that they need to be strong in, yet they also have um, an increasingly demanding curriculum. Now, a friend of mine uh, said to me, a therapist friend of me said, you know what, Anne, I really think that ADHD, the name should be totally changed. And I said, what do you think it should be? And she said, I think it should be called the disorder of motivation because every kid I see wants to do a good job in school, but they really struggle to maintain motivation. So we know that kids with ADHD have a harder time in school. And when something's harder for you, you're not naturally as motivated. Plus, there's a natural disengagement in the general population as kids get older. We know that kids, when they're young, they're pretty motivated in school. And in fifth grade, um, this is a study, a Gallup study of over 100,000 kids. In elementary school, we found that... um, Kids, by and large, are engaged in school. They like school. They're motivated by it. Um, About 7 in 10, almost 8 in 10 kids actually report that they're engaged in school. But in middle school, we see that there's a drop-off. Only 6 in 10 kids report engagement. And then by ninth grade in high school, only 4 in 10. And this is a general population. So we see that It's not just kids with ADHD, but in general, kids struggle to stay engaged in school. So how do we engage them? How do we boost their motivation? The first thing is to realize that if your child is struggling with this, it's not a character flaw. It's not that your child doesn't care or doesn't want to do a good job or wants to drive you crazy, but it's biological in nature. And here's the reason. When something is pleasurable for anybody, they kind of get this little squirt of dopamine in their brains. Um, There's a chemical reaction that occurs. Here's an example. Let's say that you have a to-do list and you get great joy from crossing something off of your to-do list. That's a little squirt of dopamine. But let's say your kid has a to-do list and they cross that same thing off because you've told them to do. They may not necessarily get that squirt of dopamine, that little pleasure center, because it's doesn't feel really great to them. So something that we might think is a great idea, they don't really see the point in it because they're not getting that biological change. It could be also, you know, making your bed. You might actually feel great after you make your bed, but so not so much of your child. You get the score, your child doesn't. Um, and so when things are not, don't feel good to kids, they're not likely to repeat them. Let's even think of academics. Here's a problem. Three plus five X equals 23. Now, you might have a kid with a great working memory who kind of likes logic and likes figuring things out and likes solving for X. That kid will solve for X and will feel great about solving that math problem. But you have another kid that they kind of struggle through it. They don't get a lot of pleasure from it. There's no dopamine coming out. They're, They're not likely to repeat it and do it again because it doesn't feel good. And so they look like they don't care. They look like it's a problem with motivation. So how do you improve? There are a number of things that we know work. Medication, getting more sleep, exercise is a great one, um, and certainly mindfulness and meditation. But also, we can make things more interesting for their kids. And when something is of high interest to anybody, the chemistry of their brain is instantly changed because you like the task and your reward is stronger. 
So as parents and teachers, we can think to ourselves, hmm, how can I make this more interesting? Well, let's say in your house, nothing to do with academics, but maybe you eat dinner every night and after dinner, it's the expectation that your kids help you with the dishes. And maybe it's really hard for your kids to engage in this because it's not inherently motivating, but you can change it around and turn on their favorite rap music or hip hop music really loud. And that might make it more interesting. Or let's say you've asked your child a million times to clean his room. He just can't muster up the gumption. Maybe you take a hula hoop, throw it in your child's room and say, just clean out the middle part, the inside of the hoop. That's making it more interesting. Maybe your child has a hard time engaging in homework at home. So instead you bring him to the library or you bring her to Starbucks. That change makes it more interesting. We see this all the time in our practice. I own a tutoring agency. I used to be a teacher. And in my classroom, I always, always saw kids struggle in this area of motivation. But as over the years, we've worked with lots of kids, I've seen them kind of fall into three buckets when they struggle with motivation. The first is like the title of the great book, Spark But Scattered. These are kids that really have a hard time with executive functioning skills, and they are really impacted by their ability to be organized and plan ahead. We also see kids that, you know, their executive functioning skills aren't bad, but they're not great, but they get by on sheer brain power, and they can sit in a classroom and absorb the lecture and do really, really well on the tests. And these kids aren't really impacted until they get older in high school and things, um, the curriculum just becomes harder for them. We also see kids that look like they don't care when they're behind and stuck. And I call these kids Swiss cheese kids. And these are the kids that um, often look like in a classroom, they're paying attention, but they're kind of in and out of attentiveness. And when they go home to do the homework, they're kind of like Swiss cheese, they have these holes. There are some things they can do, but other things they have no clue about. And um, so they don't always do their homework right, or they don't do it at all, or they'll do bits and pieces about with on it. The next day they go to class, they're Swiss cheese again. And so many things have um, made homework difficult for them. And when that happens, it looks like they're unmotivated. And once you get behind an accumulative subject like math or a foreign language, it's really hard to catch up. Now, on top of the kids that are smart but scattered, they're bright but interested, they're behind and stuck, we also see students who don't have the same value system when it comes to academics as um, their parents might. And if we can go back to the slide that is the messy room syndrome, that's what I want to talk about. You know, I don't know if you've had this issue with your child where you might value a clean room. That's important to you. You kind of like neatness. Um, Maybe you're not over the top, but, you know, having something kind of tidy feels good to you. But to your kids, it completely doesn't matter at all. And to you, having a clean room is a high value, but to your child, it's a low value. And whenever you have a high value for something and your child has a low value, there's a disconnect. And whenever you have that disconnect, sometimes power struggles can arise. So you have to ask yourself, how can I communicate better with my child? And let's talk a little bit about that because this is a big deal. First, now we know there's a biological component and sometimes you have a high value, your child has a low and your kid can press your buttons. So what do you do when it comes to um, motivating your child and communicating? Do you offer rewards? I live in a very competitive area in Washington, D.C., and it's really common for parents to pay for grades here. So a parent might say, you know what, I'll give you 20 bucks for every A you get. That's a reward. Um, Or do you punish your child? Do you say something like, you know what, if I find out from Mrs. Smith that you have one more late assignment, I'm taking away your phone for a month. Or do you completely disengage and say, you know what, I already went to sixth grade. Um, This is your homework, not mine. I'm not going to be involved. There's a lot of choices that you have. Well, 
here's what we know. We know that carrots or rewards actually are really okay. They're okay for short, simple tasks. I like the when-then approach. When you finish your math homework, then you can go outside and play with your friends. That's kind of simple. And that is perfectly fine. And it really, really works. I will say, however, if you use that approach, be really careful. Um, You don't want to um, reward your child for getting everything right. You really just want to f- focus on having it done because when you get into issues over quality with your child, like you spelled this word wrong, or you should add more adjectives, or you didn't write out all your steps in the math problem, that's when power struggles really arise and you want to kind of avoid that. So just make sure it's done. So it works for little short-term things, but it doesn't work for long-term complex things. Like the parent who pays for the A, that doesn't work because it's too far out. Nine weeks later, kids can't sustain motivation. I like to think of sticks as withholding privileges. Really, that's a better way of approaching something and getting buy-in than punishment. So it's the same thing. You know, if you, when you do this, then you can have that. But know that sticks don't work for long term things. Um, That's why a long term punishment, I'm taking this away for a long period of time, will not motivate your child. And sometimes what I've seen is that parents take away far too much so their child doesn't have anything to work towards. You know, the the Department of Education has actually invested a lot of money into studying motivation because it's an issue not just for ADHD kids, but for kids throughout the country. And there was really one great study that they spent many millions of dollars and they wanted to see, well, do motivators work for certain tasks? If we paid kids for things like getting better report card grades, reading books, just showing up at class, um, basically completing their homework on a daily basis, and working hard to improve their standardized test scores with money, a few dollars here and there, motivate kids to do these things. And what they found out was that actually paying students for certain tasks was very effective. It was effective for short-term things, reading books, going to class, and completing homework on a daily basis. It did work, but it was not at all effective for improving report card grades and standardized test scores because those things are way too far out. So now we have to think about, because it's the beginning of the school year, what do I want to tackle this year? What really impacted my child's uh, motivation last year? And what are some things that I can do? Maybe it's rewards, maybe it's consequences, maybe it's how I talk to my child. What can I do to get ahead of the curve? What you want to do now is to think about what is the worst case scenario. And I know this sounds terrible, like very negative thinking, but it's realistic for our kids. If your child has struggled with things like procrastination the last two years, it's likely that your child will struggle with it again this year. If you had a hard time pulling your child away from technology last year, it's likely that that's going to happen again this year. So you want to think, all right, what are some things I can put into place now before school starts or when school starts instead of when I see the problem occurring? Because you don't want to wait until the problem occurs. You want to plan now. So here are some common issues that we see in the kids that we work with when parents call our office. Um, Parents will often report that they have the world's best procrastinator and that if they don't poke and prod their child, he will not get started. Sometimes they'll say, my child just does the bare minimum. Some will say, my child can't detach from Snapchat. Others will say, my student turns in work inconsistently. Sometimes he doesn't, sometimes he doesn't does. Some parents will say that my daughter has just really messy binders and a messy book bag and that there are things in there in May that are there from October. Those are common things that um, we see. So how do you get started in this process? Well, First, of course, think, what do I want to change this school year? And you want to have the conversation now, not when you're in the moment, because nothing will ever go well if you approach your child when he or she is upset. So you might want to start with something like, let's say it's the procrastination issue. 
I need your help with this. I like starting with that because it kind of elicits buy and it's not you against your child, but it's asking for help. I need your help with this. Last year, we argued a lot about starting homework. And then I love these words from my friend, Steve Harner, who has a great therapy practice in our area. And I'll give you his information in a second. He says, observe the observable. And you don't want to bring emotion into it, but you want to just state what happened, what you observed. When homework was put off until late at night, you stayed up late and I had to get you out of bed in the morning. He also has a great way of modeling listening for your child because when you do bring this up to your child, you don't want to tell him what to do or her what to do. Instead, you want to elicit feedback. So you're observing the observable. I had to... um, get you started on homework and sometimes you stayed up late and then you want to open it you want to stop and let your child respond and you want to empathize with your child and hear what he has to say instead of passing judgment and then have some negotiation about what might be a better way to approach procrastination this year he has a great website um, and his website is um, call is cfa dash gw.com and that stands for child and family associates of greater washington and on steve's website he has a link called the art and science of effective communication and he has a whole article and some other resources on modeling listening and i also put the url um, at the bottom here for this exact article but anytime you can listen and empathize that really goes a long way with kids. So let's talk about practical tips because that's why we're all here. We want to know what to do. Um, And it's complicated. There's lots of things we have to do. So just maybe take one or two of these things and talk to your child about them. Well, the first is that Structure is essential for all kids, especially those with ADHD. We know that routines are essential, especially for procrastinators. And routines include where and when homework is to be done because that increases motivation. When is the time of day? Really, there are six times kids can do homework. Right after school, after a 30-minute break, before dinner, after dinner, before bed. And if they're really a procrastinator, they're doing it before school or on the bus going to school the next day. Elementary kids do well, especially those that are on medication because you don't want them doing homework too late. It can wear off after school, right after school or after a 30 minute break. I think kids really do need that break. Um, But you want to make sure if you do give them that break that you set the timer. So when the timer goes off, the timer tells them to start homework, not you. It kind of takes the emotion out of it. And you might have the requirement that there's no electronics during that break because it might be hard to get the child off of those electronics. And it doesn't have to be, say, 4.30 every day because no day is the same. But you can have that 30 minute routine. Um, Let's say you pick your child up from aftercare, they still get that 30 minute break and then the expectation is to start homework. That's a routine, it really helps with procrastination. As kids get older, they tend to push the envelope and wanna stay up later and start homework before bed. I always encourage my students to, even if you just take out all your books, your binder and you lay it on your table, that's really all you need to do. You need that visual before dinner. Even if you just write your name on that worksheet and do the first one, You need to start something before dinner. That's really key. And where is important too. I mentioned earlier that where doesn't have to be in your home. Your child might be more effective somewhere else. Um, Where doesn't have to be sitting at a desk. Kids have sat at a desk for seven and a half hours. Might not be conducive for learning. A lot of kids I work with will stand and do homework at the island at their kitchen table. Many kids will have multiple locations in which to do homework. It doesn't have to be the same place every day. Sometimes kids will lay on the couch and have a lap desk, soft on the bottom, hard on the top, and be very comfortable doing homework there. And also consider that our kids have more distractions than other students when it comes to homework online. And it used to be this was super easy to regulate from a parent's point of view. Um, But now, since so much homework is online, you don't know if your child is actually doing the history assignment or um, watching videos on YouTube. So if you've had a problem with your child surfing the internet when he is supposed to be doing homework, 
and you found that he was doing homework for four hours in his bedroom last year, but he was really watching videos for three and a half hours, you might want to head that off early on this year and say, listen, to start, um, let's talk about another place that homework can be done. And usually the first floor, if you have a two-story home, is a good idea because you have a little bit more oversight there. A couple of apps to help. I really like these, and I found that my students really want to resist the distractions. They just cannot do it themselves. Self-control is for Mac, stay focused for Windows-based PCs, but allows kids to blacklist certain websites that they deem to be distracting for a certain period of time. You know, I don't want to go to Pinterest and um, Amazon for the next 20 minutes. For phones, I love Forest. It's a really easy app for kids. Um, they activate the app for 30 minutes, a tree starts to grow. And if they allow the tree to grow and don't use their phone, it will mature into this beautiful tree in their forest. However, if they go to Instagram or go to Snapchat or something else, the tree withers and dies. And this is motivating because kids like to plant the tree and later on they can plant another tree. Parents often ask about music, you know, is it good or bad? And the research shows that it's, it's not great for long-term retention if you're studying for a test, for example. And that's because your attention is split between listening to the lyrics and um, trying to study and retain that information. So um, sometimes kids will have a homework playlist, and these are songs that they've heard over and over again, so they're really not as distracting. Um, I have a friend of mine who's a therapist who says her, her the clients she works with have found a lot of success with putting the, um, their phone on a, like an iHome and putting it um, across the room so it's more like ambient noise, and they're not always fast-forwarding through Spotify and going back and looking and searching their library for songs. Cell phones, what do you do about them? Well, the truth is kids really don't need their cell phones to do homework, but sometimes, especially older kids, um, it's hard to regulate them. And it's really hard to tell your 17 year old that you're gonna hold their phone for three hours while they do homework, but you can teach them to hopefully regulate it a little bit better. And there's some research showing that tech breaks are really helpful um, in increase engagement and motivation. So that means the student uh, works on, puts their phone on a different side of the room, works on their homework, and then goes and checks their text messages or um, their Twitter feed for two minutes and they're back to homework for 20 minutes. FOMO is fear of missing out. And some of our students feel like they have to have their phone in front of them or they're gonna miss out on something. So we wanna hopefully teach kids to regulate their use of their phones. But for little kids, even middle schoolers, they may not have that self-regulation ability. So many parents have found, you know what, when homework starts, everything electronic, iPad, iPhone, um, laptop goes on the charging station and they can have it back when homework is done. So I really think it's important to realize that school may not always be motivating to our child, that there are certain things we can do to make it easier and make it more engaging for our student. However, we also know that there are other things that your child is going to do later in life and probably major in college that he or she really loves. And these are the things that we really want to notice in our kids. You know, even if your son is great at Minecraft, but doesn't love anything about school, you want to notice the strengths that he does show you. And you might say things like, even though Minecraft drives you crazy, you might say things like, oh gosh, I love how you're so analytical. You're always thinking about the next step. I can see an engineer in you later on. My younger son uh, is amazingly good at memorizing commercials. And I often said to him when he was little, oh my gosh, you have such a knack for, for remembering these catchy sayings and you're always coming up with creative ideas for ads. I can see you um, in advertising later on. And those things are motivating to kids. Also know that praise can be very effective in motivating kids, but it has to be the right kind. Carol Dweck wrote a great book called Mindset. She's out of Stanford. And she found in a number of studies that praise only works if you praise effort. For example, I can tell you're working really, really hard on that art project or, wow, you put an extra 10 minutes in on studying your spelling words. That is far more motivating than saying something like, you're so smart. 
I know you can do well in math, or you're just as smart as your sister. Focusing on intelligence actually demotivates kids. So at the end of the day, I love, love, love this quote from Russell Barkley. He says, don't sacrifice your parent-child relationship on the altar of academic performance. He knows from working with lots of kids with ADHD that there is going to at some point be a disconnect between their strengths and what's expected in school. And you certainly don't want to sacrifice your relationship with your child. The change begins with you. At the end of the day, it's really what you can do as a parent, not your child, that's going to make the biggest difference this school year. And it may not always be delivered by you. So for example, if your child is struggling with being organized and planning ahead, it might be that you need somebody else to deliver the message to your child. I'll never forget um, years ago when my younger son was in fifth grade, he's off to college now, but we, I tried to encourage him to use this calendar. This was before Google Calendar. It was just a paper and pencil calendar to map out his long-term projects. And he had done that in fourth grade and it really helped him to uh, reduce some of the procrastination he was experiencing. And so I said to him, hey, this worked out really well last year. Um, would you think about doing this this year? And he's like, no, mom, I got it. I don't need to do, I don't need to do that. I can totally remember what I have to do. And I just thought at the time, hmm, this isn't going to go well, but no matter what I said, he wouldn't listen to me. So I hired a coach for my company to come in and work with him. And at the end of the session, I said, how did it go? And he's like, mom, oh my gosh, we got so much done. Look, we came up with this calendar. And I swear it was almost the same exact calendar that I showed him, but because it came from somebody else, it was much more meaningful to him and he is more willing to use it. So here are some resources for you that might help you at least get started. And there are free downloadable eBooks from our website, ectutoring.com slash resources slash free dash resources. And also on our website, ectutoring.com, we have a really great blog and I've written a lot of good articles on motivation. So if you go to the blog page and on the upper right-hand side, just type in motivation to the search bar, you'll be able to find a lot of articles on the topic. So I just wanted to end with my information. If you have questions or if there's um, something I didn't cover that you wanna ask me personally about your child, feel free to reach out to me at any time. My um, email is ann at ectutoring.com. So Susan, I'm going to turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Ann. That was, you were so optimistic. I'm encouraged just listening to you. Um, I thought your, your characterization of the three types of students that you tended to see was extremely eye-opening. It just rang so true to me. Um, I wonder if you could amplify a little bit on mm -hmm. those for each of those three types, um, what what kinds of techniques you think work best? I think one was a smart but scattered mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. One was um, bright but just you no know, didn't pay attention to executive function until you know later in their high school years when they couldn't long term plan and came into play. And then the third kid that I thought was such an insightful concept was the one with. Um, Swiss cheese with holes in their um, basic skills. Um, so maybe if we could go back to those three and um, maybe talk a little bit about each one. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. I think that the smart but scattered kid, we all see, and this is the student that can kind of keep up academically for the most part, but they're because they are impacted by weak executive functioning skills, they have a great deal of difficulty across the board. And it's not like they have a reading problem or a math, you know, difficulty in math, and so they just have trouble in math. When you have, when you have poor organizational skills, you're impacted in all of your classes. And it's really, really frustrating for parents because they see, well, gosh, if you could just be more organized, school would be so much easier for you. And um, I see this a lot in our area, I may have mentioned, but there's just like, there's so many type A parents here. And when they have a child who's a little bit more laid back and kind of like the type B kid who's kind of go with the flow kid and doesn't really care if they're disorganized or not. 
um, it really can um, make kid, make parents <laughs> very frustrated. And so for these kids, it's super important to have basic structure, but to not go overboard. Because if you're type A and you're trying to implement all these super meticulous organizational strategies, your child will absolutely resist you. So you just want to start with the bare necessities. And maybe, for example, I mentioned um, the charging station before homework starts, but I love the idea of a charging station at night. And at night, you might say, um, everybody needs to have all their electronics on this charging station by eight o'clock and also all your things for school the next day into your launching pad. And the launching pad is basically a, you know, a box or a bin, something like that in the kitchen or by the door your child's going to exit in the morning. And so you're get, making sure your child has everything in it he needs for school the next day. Backpack could be their flute if they're in the band, their soccer cleats, whatever. But getting kids into the routine of being organized the night before makes mornings go a little bit smoother. Um, so again, starting out with simple things for this to mark that scattered kid. The bright but uninterested kid, um, these are kids that really drive parents crazy because they don't see the need to work harder because they're already getting really good grades. And so they're absolutely unwilling to take parent feedback. Um, and usually it's not a big deal until they get into high school and they've decided to take some honors classes, maybe an AP class, but it just completely blows up in their faces because they haven't had any practice or had to work hard before. And these are kids that really do need to have um, like an educational coach in place or somebody to, not only to help them navigate um, basic study skills, but help them to work more efficiently as well. Because they've never had to use study skills before, um, they can often feel overwhelmed and defeated because they've never experienced a disappointment. And they really need somebody by their side to help them navigate the waters. And then behind and stuck, um, I was a behind and stuck kid when I was a child, and it, it really happened starting in fourth grade when I had a hard time with math. But I, I'll never forget when I was in middle school, I was in eighth grade and I was taking algebra one, and I had such a hard time, and every day I would walk into class and I would say, okay, Anne, this is going to be your day, you're going to learn to solve for X. And I would always sit in the front of the room, and I would always try so hard to pay attention to my teacher solving for X on the board. But within five minutes, I was completely out to lunch because it made no sense to me. I couldn't focus. And my teacher thought I was unmotivated, but I wasn't unmotivated. I just couldn't sustain focus. And so when I went home to do the homework, I didn't really know how to do it. And so I didn't do it at all. And then I started to lose interest in math. And then I started to lose interest in my other subjects because I was a complete failure at math. And um, it wasn't until my mother, who in back then nobody really had tutors, but she was smart enough to get me somebody who could fill in that the gaps with me because I was Swiss cheese. And once I got somebody who could fill in the holes for me, I could pay attention better in class the next day because it made more sense to me. So for kids that are behind and stuck, it's not a character issue. And it's not just if they tried harder or paid attention more, they're going to do better. They need somebody to go back, whether they, you know, it's a teacher and an after school club or the teacher helps them at lunch or they have a tutor or whomever, but they really have to have help to fill in those holes. Makes sense. Yeah, that really makes sense. Which um, there are a couple, there are a couple people have a couple questions about what do you think the best way to find an educational coach is or a tutor? I think uh, the best, yeah, the best way um, is to really, if you know somebody who has a kid who has struggled with these types of things, ask your friends. I try, you know, although you can ask your friends with super high achieving kids, you may not get somebody that really understands students with executive functioning and attention issues. So um, I think you're going to get your best results by asking people that you know. Sometimes schools know, but as parents, we kind of assume that schools know everything, but they often don't specialize in this nitty gritty and they may not know either. Um, so your friends, maybe if you have a, a therapist you're working with, um, you can also do a Google search to educational coaches in your town, and you can find agencies that also specialize in this type of thing. My daughter ha had some tutors in high school. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you? Go ahead. 
No, no, go ahead, Susan. Um, I found that sometimes a student who was um, only a few years older than she was was very effective, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, uh, absolutely. And you know, like a, a recent college grad when she was in high school or even a, a college student sometimes was really helpful because she sort of related really well to them, um, which raises a fit that one of the readers, one of the listeners asked about fit. She says mm -hmm. she's found tutors, but they just don't, they don't fit well with their, with mm -hmm. their child. And they wonder how to do a better job of, you know, trying that, doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. What you think, but I, I just thought you had to just try and see if it worked before you commit. Yeah. You do. But you also think back, you know, what kind of teacher has your child liked in the past? Mm -hmm. We ask parents that a lot and they come up with all kinds of crazy things. You know, sometimes people say, oh, somebody really young and fun, like a cheerleader. Or parents will mm -hmm. say somebody really structured and seasoned. So think what kind of teacher has your child done well with in the past? Has this person used a lot of humor? Is this person who somebody who's really organized and structured and has clear expectations? Mm -hmm. Or is it somebody kind of like what you mentioned, Susan, somebody who they can really relate to that is kind of young on the younger side and maybe really enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. uh, think about that match. And then when you're talking to somebody, see if they kind of have those qualities you're looking for. Um, but I agree. I think you need to work with that person and not just meet that person because anybody can make a great first impression. I personally think your child needs to work with that person to, to make sure it's a, a good match first. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to turn to another topic that we have a couple of three or four questions around this general topic. And that is, um, and now I think we're talking uh, elementary, late elementary, I'll get mm -hmm. to high school, college later, for those of you who asked about that. Um, and that is how to get your child to start their homework. And a corollary question from a different person is, what do you do if your child just doesn't listen when the 30 minute break is over, just keeps mm -hmm. saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so two variations on the theme of, of how do you get your child to get started? with homework. Mm -hmm. This well, assumes, I think, that you're there managing it, which I think yeah. many parents can't do that, but yeah. They can't do that. And so if you're going to have a routine with the timer, you, you really do have to be there when it goes off. Right. Um, you're going to find that your child, if you're implementing this for the first time, they will resist you big time. And it will look like this isn't working because um, they're they're really resistant to something new. And sometimes it takes a couple of weeks of you not backing down um, mm -hmm. that you're going to have this new kind of structure where the timer goes off and the expectation is to start homework. But at first, kids will, will resist it, and that's okay. But keep going with it. Um, so to get kids to start, you really need to make the environment ripe for learning. And that means your child may not have anything else that he or she can gravitate towards. So if the TV is on or um, there's something going on that's more interesting to your child, they're going to want to go towards that. So you kind of have to remove anything that could be distracting, like if they have their iPad, they shouldn't have their iPad if the TV is on, make sure it's off things like that to get them started and always let them pick what they want to start. And I always think for kids that are really um, have a hard time getting started, I know a lot of parents will say to me, oh, I always make my child start with the hardest thing. That way the hardest thing is done first. But if your child is really, really resisting you, have them start with the easiest thing because sometimes that puts them in the better frame of mind. For example, if they're really good at completing their spelling pretty independently, have encourage them to do that. Let them pick what they want to do first. Also, if it is hard for them, like math, let them do the ones that they know how to do first. That's okay. They can solve those first. And sometimes that gets them in the mood of, of getting started. The other thing that I've heard, and I wonder whether you agree with this, is that um, when you get to a specific homework assignment that you, the parent, should do the first item with your child to make sure they understand it and then distance yourself, but as a way to get them started to make sure that they um, can tackle it, just go through the first question with them. Does that, do, you, do you advise that? Absolutely, because I think as parents, we automatically assume that our kid just doesn't want to do it, and that's why they're not getting started. But sometimes it's that the child is overwhelmed and underprepared, mm -hmm. and it may seem easy to us, but to them, it's really not. And so they do need us to help them 
get started on that first one or two, make sure they can do it, and then you walk away. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think we keep hearing so much in our from our experts about how much anxiety under is exists in kids and how much of how much of their problems can that appear to be motivation or other behaviors are really driven by anxiety. Do you agree with that, Ann? I do. Uh, I mean, there yeah. is just so much overlap between anxiety and procrastination and motivation issues. And a lot of times, you know, in fact, I was talking to a therapist friend of mine who said, they're starting to see this new form of OCD that's called just right. And it, it's not, yeah, I know, it's kind of interesting because we think of OCD as, oh, well, you're lining up your shoes, you know, right. um, you're washing your hands 87 times. But actually there's a lot of kids that I, got, I see so many kids like this where it has to be just right. They're not overly obsessive, but they right. want to make sure that um, they've written it, they, their handwriting is just right, or this is, you know, just a just right paragraph, or they've lined up their numbers just right. And so they won't start or they won't go on to the next one until the first one is just right. Perfect. And, wow. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I think it's, it's important to really step back and think, okay, wait, maybe it's not that my child is struggling with motivation and they don't want to do it, but maybe they're a just right kid, or maybe they're feeling overwhelmed and underprepared. And what can I mm -hmm. do to make this entry into this next problem easier for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think if so much of this comes down to taking an empathetic approach with your child rather than a punitive one, you know, I think yeah. if you, I, you, that I thought your comments about empathetic listening were incredibly helpful, um, hard to implement, I think, but definitely, um, on the right track. Um, turning to high school and college, um, couple of people who are listening in, and I've certainly heard this before, say that their children are really resistant to any intervention on their part. Um, one, they, the child wants to be completely independent, and one person says, you know, their, their daughter wants to be completely independent but forgets all her deadlines. How do we help? And someone else asked the same question about their college student. You know, how do they keep a child on track when um, they're not in the, in the elementary school years, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me start with a high school student. And oh my gosh, I, this is so, so hard because as parents, we're really worried. And um, we know that if we don't intervene at all, this isn't really going to go well. But at the same time, our kids are pushing us away and resisting all of our overtures to help. So how do we find that, that balance that's appropriate for a 16-year-old? And, you know, I've been through this myself with my own son, and it, it is so, so difficult um, I found that when I could get any support from the school where he was staying after school for office hours or extra help, that was always incredibly helpful. Mm. Um, I also try to use Sunday nights to plan ahead. And I, and I, even though I do this for a living and I wanted to say, well, you know what? 84% of kids study by rereading and that's actually the most ineffective way to study. And <laughs> it's just my nature to say, this is how you do it. I really had to stop myself and pull back and um, talk more big right. pictures. So on Sunday nights, I would say things like, oh, tell me what you have going on this week. Oh, what are some things that, do you have any big projects do? Or, oh, what about that, you know, science fair or whatever it is? And I would let him do more of the talking. And then I might ask, oh, do you feel like you've done everything for that? And I tried not to needle him on, you know, the details of it and let him think about it more globally. And it was interesting because sometimes he would have his laptop there and he'd say things like, oh wait, I'll be right back. And I know he'd go up to his room and try to find the papers, but just sometimes having that global dialogue um, right. before things help. Um, but also really, you know, as parents, we don't know how to do chemistry for the most part. We yeah, don't right, have to right. work kids with, with algebra too. So sometimes getting somebody else in that's not you can be a big yeah. support. Yeah. Oh, just a comment here from um, one of the listeners who wanted to report that she found a great, the way she found an outstanding tutor for her son in college was through a neighborhood email net network. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I am on a network of parents in New York, and I have to say that the resources from the other parents are just extraordinary. And she's saying that, that she sent an email through this local email system and 
neighbors referred tutors to her and they were wonderful. So um, yeah, I do recommend that system that you, that you mentioned. Oh, that's, Specifically word yeah, of mouth. that's a great idea. Yeah. I word of mouth. A, yeah. A Facebook email, group or anything helpful. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Let's see. Um, here's someone who asks, he knows someone or she knows someone who makes a contract with their child and the mm-hmm. parent and the child sign it. Is this a good idea for a 15-year-old is the question. If the contract is short-term enough, I think it's okay. Mm-hmm. If it's a long-term contract, it will likely not work. So right. Right. sometimes I've seen contracts with parents that say, you know, if you have a 3.5, I will um, buy you a car when you're 16 and three months or however old <laughs> you have to be to drive. And that type of thing won't work well. But you can have simple contracts that both sign, but there has to be something in it for both parties. If it's too one-sided for you and you're the winner, it will not work. But if it's equally as positive for your child and they get something out of it, because a lot of our kids are what's in it for me kids, then it will probably be fine. Okay. Um, Speaking of what's in it for me kids, a couple of questions. I think all of us really are fundamentally uncomfortable with the idea of paying kids to do schoolwork, which we feel is something they should want to do, even though we know that's not true, (laughs) but that's why we're here. But um, James listening in puts it this way. He says, do you think the rewards of money for success create a problem? In my own life, I see that I tend to look for monetary rewards in a lot of areas that are unrealistic and cause me problems down, you know, in various relationships. So in general, could you talk some more about the use of of cash, cold cash, for for rewards for kids? I don't like the idea of cash for grades because it's, it's, first of all, grades are super complicated. Um, Uh In order to get a product, which is a grade, you have to have a process. And the process is what you do to achieve the grade on a daily basis. For example, you have to finish your homework on time and turn it in. You have to study, even if it's a little bit for an upcoming test. You have to be able to regulate your um, consumption of media in order to study effectively and enough. So when you're only rewarding for a product, you're completely forgetting the process along the way. And um, I like the idea of noticing the process better than the product. And I've never seen, um, I know research does work for, to show that kids um, do benefit from, you know, the daily things like going to class and they do respond to money, but I would not recommend giving money to your child for those types of things because it doesn't increase their intrinsic motivation to do those things. So when you gave the examples of using cash, you were using, giving it for, you were suggesting it was useful for effort, you were saying then, or? Right. What are some examples of? Yeah, so they just use money, and this was a study by the Department of Education. Right. I only brought it up showing that it it does, rewards do work for short-term things, but not Not for for Um, long-term. But it doesn't have to be money. I'm sure if they offered the kids something else, like, you know, it could be anything tangible. They would have had the same outcome, but money was just the easiest thing because right. it has value to everybody. Whereas, right. you know, a bracelet might be of value to a girl, but not to a boy, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another person says, you know, how do we use, um, what kind of a motivation can we come up with that's not something we want to discourage, i.e. screen, that we want to encourage, i.e. screen time. I think screen time, as you know, is a perennial issue mm-hmm. among our, our listeners mm-hmm. And she, I guess she's saying that the obvious motivator would be screen time, but that's exactly what she doesn't necessarily want to be encouraging. Right. And I, you know, I work with a lot of parents that say they've gotten to the point where it's become so contentious in their house, this battle over screen time that they've said Monday through Thursday, there are no screens. And then on Friday, wow. Saturday and Sunday, yeah, you can have screens for a limited amount of time. Um, and I think, in some cases, these parents, it's just been so, so negative in their house. They feel like they've really lost a relationship with their kids over technology that they're willing to take such a, a big stance. Um, right. But in some families, you know, they'll say they, they don't even really reward for anything um, in, the, in the immediate. So they might just have the it, it, kind of like the rule of thumb in their house that homework needs to be started around a certain time 
And after a certain time at night, the kids can watch TV. So they could have the screen of a TV, which is not as addicting as, say, an Xbox. That's right. But they put it to late at night because if you say, hey, when you're done with your homework, you can play video games. I can bet you your kid is going to get your, their homework done in seven and a half minutes, and it's mm-hmm. not going to be good quality. <laughs> right. And so you may want to change what you, you know, the screen doesn't have to be something that they absolutely love. It can be something they kind of like, and it can be later in the evening. Yeah. Do, where do you come out on the, on the amount of time, this, this question that always comes up, so I'm just going to ask it now. Um, where, where do you come out on the amount of time? kids should be allowed screen time per day. We sort of heard an hour. I mean, parents really sort of feel like they need that anchor mm-hmm. you know, of how to, how to tackle this. Honestly, I think it's virtually impossible to keep tabs on how long your kid has been right. on screen time. I just, uh, I think it's so, so difficult. Parents have just such a tough job in this area that it's, it's hard to say two hours because you don't know really when your child is, using technology and then well does that include when they have to go online to do their homework does that not include that so that's why i like the idea of no electronics unless they're needed for homework until after a certain time a certain time okay it's far more easier to monitor that than saying you get this for this amount of time um right it's it but it's again much easier to monitor for kids once you give a kid a cell phone all bets are off. And that's, that's really true. That's really so true. you want to yeah. try to delay giving your child a cell phone as long as you can. Okay. Oh, really? Delay the cell phone as long as you can. And what are you seeing in terms of ages kids are getting cell phones now? You know, I was talking to um, somebody I know in um, Washington State, and I was saying, yeah, you know, here kids get cell phones in like fourth grade, fifth grade. She's like, oh my gosh, here? That's not the case at all. Kids get cell phones when they're like 14. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it depends on the part of the United States. Yeah, I think if, so. Hey, listeners, if you're on online, listen, post the age at which your child got a cell phone. That'd be really interesting to find out. Um, we should, you know, because, yeah, it's such a huge, you're right. Once they have a cell phone in their hand, you know, it, nothing you can do. And mm-hmm. I thought your suggestion of a, of a cell phone break a five minute cell phone break was pretty realistic given the addiction that we all have to our cell phones, right? It's not just our kids. <laughs> oh, right. I know it's all of us. And that's why, you know, if you, if you have given a cell phone to your child and they're pretty young, that's when you can control it and say, look, um, but when you get home from school, you can check your phone, but then it goes into this basket until six thirty or something like that. And then you have far more control over it. Well, um, the people are posting. It's really interesting. They, it tends to be 13, 14, 12, 18 years old. Um, you know, so not as young as you might think. 10, 8th grade, when kids are playing sports. A lot of 8th grade, soon 8th grade, high school, 12. So, you know, that's, oh, here's someone who said, I gave it to, my son got one at 12, 10, but I had to take it away from him because it was too much. So now we're thinking about it at 17. Um, yeah, it's most, I would say the average here is 12 or 13, um, or a few younger and a few older, but that's interesting. Um, so yes. Also, Anne, um, you're just such great, you have such great practical tips and such wonderful experience. Can you repeat just one last time for everyone, your, um, web URL so that, um, people can take advantage of the great free resources you have? Absolutely. Thanks, Susan. It's uh, www.ec, as in educational connections, tutoring.com. Okay. Great webinar someone posted. So, and thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you next week. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.